I'm sorry. Good evening. Welcome to our candlelight service. I'd like to start with ah, a prayer, as, and John's going to come up to deliver that, and, but we welcome you all this evening. Your greeting in prayer time. Uh, we're looking forward to Christmas morning where we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so welcome here, and may you be blessed, may you be encouraged, may you be taught of the Spirit. Thank you. Father, I thank you for this opportunity that we have to trust you, to strengthen ourselves and encourage ourselves in you, in the Spirit of your holy ways. And I pray, Father, that you just bless our time together tonight. Strengthen each and individual, every individual heart here. And may this be a glorious time of worship to you with thankfulness in our heart for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou day spring, come and cheer our spirits by thine advent here. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night. And death's dark shadows put to flight. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou wisdom from on high, and order all things far and nigh. Do us the path of knowledge show, and cause us in our ways to go. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to in one heart and mind bid envy, strife and quarrel cease fill all the world with heaven's peace rejoice, rejoice Emmanuel shall come to
his birth. Open up the gates, heaven comes to earth. A host of angels sing, our Savior here to dwell. The King of every King, our Emmanuel. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to our God. Behold the Son of Man here in a manger lane, worthy is the Lamb. For he has come to save, to take away our sin. He freely gave his life, born that we may live, and in him never die. Hosanna, 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 in the highest. Hosanna to our God. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings. Glory to the newborn King, Hosanna, 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 in the highest, Hosanna, in the highest, Hosanna. In the highest Hosanna to our God. Hail the heaven born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all He brings, glory to the newborn King, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. In the highest, Hosanna, in the highest, Hosanna, in the highest, Hosanna. Hello, I'd like to share with everyone the passage of Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 14. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, 
who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And then suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. And with that as our setting, I invite you to stand and sing with us as we continue that thought. Angels from the realms of glory, wing your flight o'er all the earth. Ye who sang creation's story, now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come and worship, come and worship, watch and praise a newborn King. Shepherds in the fields abiding, watching o'er your flocks by night. God with man is now residing. Stay. 
preparing this meditation, I was thinking about the four themes of Advent, hope, peace, joy, love, and thinking about how there's so many great examples of that in this world and how many counterexamples there are. And if we could dim the house lights right now. Thank you. Darkness is all around us. And not just the physical darkness of this room, but spiritual darkness. In the Middle East, in North Africa, there are currently more than 45 active armed conflicts. In the rest of Africa, there are another over 35 active armed conflicts, plus another 21 in Asia, seven in Europe, six in Latin America. Beyond armed conflict, there are cultural battles raging with the enemy of all human souls actively trying to destroy that which God has created, the individual's relationship with God, marriage and family, and social order. He's desperately trying to convince everyone that right is wrong and wrong is right. Amid that darkness, we have been called we have been charged to carry the light of truth, sharing it in love. The truth that God made us, that he gave us the rules for living our best life and for worshiping him. That we have broken those rules and cannot make it right on our own. That in our inability to effect reconciliation with God, God did it for us by sending his son Jesus to show us the way to reconciliation with God and each other and not just show us, but to actually become the way to salvation and eternal life. We see in the Old Testament prophecies that God gave promises of salvation, realized in the message of the gospel, offering us hope, not wishful thinking, but tangible, take it to the bank, assured hope. And as we accept his salvation, we experience his peace that goes beyond any human comprehension. And in that salvation, we find joy that strengthens us for whatever spiritual battles we face, knowing that the battle is his, not ours, and that his victory is given to us. And we can read in Revelation that God will show us his love by bringing heaven down to earth at the end of days, at the end of the days of this world. The dim shadow will give way to the bright reality as the new Jerusalem is established on the renewed earth, and he will be our light. Until then, let us purpose in our hearts to be his light in this world. When this service is over and we part company, we will leave these candles here. 
but let us never leave our light in this room. May we each bear our light, His light, piercing the spiritual darkness that surrounds us, just as these candles pierce the physical darkness. By our light, our witness, may those around us know that Jesus is the reason for the season. Let's pray with me. Father God, we thank you for the peace, the hope, the love, the joy that you have given us. The things that we celebrate at this season where we celebrate your coming into this world. And though we know it wasn't on December 25th in particular, it's the day that we've set aside to honor that coming, that advent, that putting on of flesh, being clothed in the temple of humanness or a tabernacle of humanness that you would walk among us, that you would be like us, that you would show us the way to you, that you would become our sacrifice for sin, that you would become our means of reconciliation to the Father, and that you would become our hope in eternal life. As we come around this table, as we light these candles in prayer for the new year, Pray that you would renew and restore our spirits, that you would be prompting us and help us to have the ears to hear your spirit speaking to us, leading us, guiding us into your truth as we walk through this world. May we not succumb to the darkness. May we not be conformed to this world, but transformed newly every day into your image, your likeness, so that others may see what we do and be able to give you the glory. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And John, would you give us some instructions? This is our time of communion. God has given us, Jesus gave us specifically, two things that we do to make it so that we are solidly in Christ. The number one is the baptism. That's the focus on the individual. When a person makes a decision for Christ, we lower them in the waters of baptism. They die as Christ died, but then they rose, rise again as Christ rose. But God gave us a second means by which we remember Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. And that is the time of communion. It's togetherness that we have here. It's a communion with God himself, but it is also a time of remembrance with my brothers and sisters in Christ here amongst us. So we are doing it together. That's why it's called communion. Like community, it's communion. We are together to do this. And so as we come to this place where we have this communion together, there's a couple of things that we do here. Is we take the bread and we take the wine, of course, and remember Jesus and what he did for us. But then also... As we do that, we also have the candles. And there's, you grab a candle and light it, and as you light that, you're showing forth the light of Christ in you that might shine in the world around us. And you give that to an attendant up here, and they will plop it in the thing. Sometimes it goes plop. And then we'll put it up here, and you'll see the transformation. The amount of light that we have here now is multiplied. Every single candle adds more light, and how important that is for us to know that. So, when you come, it, there's plenty of time. You don't have to come immediately. You don't have to get in line if you don't want to. You just wait, and the people come, and you find a place. You come, and you, you come together as families or as groups of people, and you partake together this feast that we have for you. It's not going to fill you up very much, but it will fill your spirit with goodness and God. God is, God is good in this service. And so with that in mind, I will have a word of prayer, and we will begin. Uh, the workers, you can make a choice of either coming up immediately and taking or taking, or you can wait and see your parent and your, your family group get to come together or at the end of the service, whatever you want to do. It's okay. You'll, you'll, it'll figure out and we'll figure anything else as it goes. But may this be a blessing to your soul as we
we come and have this time of communion. Father, I thank you so very much for our opportunity to just remember that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is our source. He is our everything. He is, he is amazing. And his love for us is amazing. And we come today to remember his death, the shedding of his blood, his being buried, and after three days, his rising again to give us that new hope, a new life, that on that great and glorious day when you call an end to the foolishness of this world, that we shall be like him because we shall see him just as he is. I pray every heart here is touched by your grace here tonight and your mercy in the remembrance of what Jesus has accomplished for us. Bless your people today, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
invite you to go backwards in time in your mind with me to about 2,000 some years ago. And imagine that I'm not Rick anymore, but uh, somebody else. Ours is not an easy job. As our father Jacob said, the heat consumed me in the daytime and cold at night drove sleep from my eyes. But being a shepherd is what God gave me to do. Should I be like wondering Job and question why that lot was cast to me? Or like faithful Job and simply believe that God is sovereign and accept his will for me and try to be the best shepherd I can? It is also not easy to live up to the example of scriptural shepherds. From the time of Father Abraham through Isaac and Jacob, we have been God's chosen people. And Jacob himself was a shepherd, as were Moses and David. Like them, we spend most of our lives out in the fields, keeping watch over these helpless animals day and night, with little rest and even fewer opportunities to clean ourselves up, much less leave the flocks to attend any kinds of services at the temple. We may tramp through their drippings or their droppings. Flies are constant unwanted companions. We bind their wounds as well as our own. With all that, isn't it amazing that our job is figuratively applied to leaders and kings? But Helpless animals, though sheep may be, you do come to care for them. Their dependence, though frustrating and exhausting, is almost endearing. One gets to the point of risking life and limb to take care of the little four-legged baba blankets. And I remember the time Abimael left the rest of his flock in our care to chase down a sheep who had gotten, you know, wandered off and gotten stuck in a crag. It took him quite a while to find and rescue that one, but when he did, he led it back to the flock. And I'm not sure whether the song he sang was purely for joy at finding the lost sheep or if it was to keep his temper in check, but there's some combination of the two. But either way, God be praised. And these little fuzzballs need a lot of care beyond simple rescue operations. They need protection from the wolf and the lion they need us to lead them to food, to water, to safety. They need us to keep them together, as Abimael discovered when one went missing. And amazingly, the sheep learn to listen to and even distinguish our voices. When I call my sheep, they listen to me and ignore the other shepherds, just as the other shepherd's sheep ignore me and listen to their own. You know, it reminds me a lot about what the former shepherd, King David, wrote, describing God as our shepherd, who provides so bountifully that we lack nothing, who makes us lie down in green pastures, who leads us beside still waters, who restores our souls, who leads us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. When I think that God allowed David to portray him as a shepherd, I almost feel honored to be a shepherd myself. And if I imagine God feeling about me the way I feel about wayward sheep, oh, it makes me think about my own waywardness. Does he feel as frustrated with me as I can feel with these flaky little fuzzballs? Dare I believe that he cares for me like I care for them? Would he give his life in place of mine like I would dare die defending my sheep? But that's just silly. I mean, how could God die? <laughs> and sometimes I wonder if I would be a better shepherd if I could become one of the sheep. Would they follow me more closely if I were one of them? Of course, I would still have to be myself so I would know how to take care of them and protect them and all of that, but... She makes you think, eh? But you didn't come here to hear, come to hear me talk about a shepherd becoming a sheep or God dying to save me or the woes of an outcast among God's chosen people. You came to hear about 
that night. It was a night like so many others. Us shepherds were taking turns on the watch while the others rested and tried to sleep. The cool night air following the day's heat, the countless stars in the sky. I've heard that some people see pictures in groups of stars and even, and even have given them names. But when I look for pictures in the stars, you know what I see? Yeah, sheep. Same thing happens with... Yeah. Actually, it's a joke. We do know the shapes of the stars. You see, the stars move over the course of the night. And it helps us to track the time. And I know the stars shift slowly throughout the year to mark the seasons. But they all move and shift together. Well, all except for the five wandering stars. They seem to be like wayward sheep, not walking in the way of the rest of the flock, not following the lead of their shepherd. So I wonder, why does God allow those five to wander? Or does he merely direct their steps differently from the others? Does their wandering have any meaning for us? I guess you'd have to ask a wiser man than I. Anyway, usually we were well outside of Bethlehem, away from the farms and the fields, so the sheep wouldn't eat the crops. Nothing but trouble when that happens. But after the harvest and the gleaning time at the end of summer, we are allowed to let our flock graze on the stubble for a few weeks before the farmer prepares his field for plowing before the autumn rains. And it's a win-win situation. Our sheep get to eat. We're a little bit closer to home. Farmer gets fertilizer. Everybody's happy, right? So that's where we were on that night. In the days before that, there seemed to be more people on the road than usual, but it was hard to be sure. I think it might have been time for one of the seven festivals, but something else may have been going on as well. I don't remember because I was quite young at the time. I mean, most of us shepherds are under 18 years old. A lot of us are girls. Uh, but there, there we were in the fields around Bethlehem in the late summer, watching our flocks by night when it happened. Out of nowhere, a shining person appeared, bigger than the biggest Roman soldier I'd ever seen, brighter than a full moon in the middle of the night. And you can bet I was scared. People don't just appear out of nowhere. People aren't that big, and people don't shine. I know I heard at least one scream, and I don't know if it came from me, but before we could make ourselves move, either to fight or run, he spoke with a voice that I can't describe. It had the clarity of a bell or a trumpet, but at the same time it was deep and weighty. And he said, don't be afraid. <laughs> but I wasn't quite sure whether to believe him. That feeling of fear does not just disappear as quickly as it comes on. But he continued, Listen, I bring you good news that will, be, that will bring great joy to people everywhere. He still had my attention. My mind was racing with questions about what was happening, but he wasn't done talking yet. On this day in the city of David, a Savior has been born. He is the Messiah, your Lord. I was amazed. The Messiah? The one who would deliver us? We had waited so long for the Messiah to come. Was it finally happening? Was it real? How could we know? And the angel, because I finally recognized this shining person as a messenger from God, then gave us a way to test the truth of his message. He said, here's your sign, and here's how you'll know it is him. He will be wrapped in cloths and lying in a feeding trough. And as if one shining angel wasn't enough, suddenly there were thousands upon thousands of angels surrounding us, looking very much like a vast army laying siege to a town. I confess, I jumped again. And they began to shout as if it were a battle cry, but it was a shout of praise. They raised their hands toward heaven and said, as if in one voice, the highest honor and glory be to God in heaven. It was, and still is, thrilling and unnerving. And their next words, though equally powerful, felt more like a benediction. 
and let his peace rest upon those on earth who please him. I don't know if what happened next I saw or merely imagined, but I think I heard a million scrapes of metal as the angels with the precision of expert soldiers drew their swords in salute. And as they then raised those swords skyward, they kept going, their feet lifting off the ground as they ascended toward God's presence in heaven. And after we gathered our wits, we talked with each other, the Messiah, a sign, angels, sheep. <laughs> Duty clashed against the thrill of the message we had heard. What would happen to us if we left our flocks to seek out the Messiah? We were children. Who would believe our story, and especially one like that? But finally, we reasoned that the angel wouldn't have given us a location, wouldn't have given us proof of his message, wouldn't have given us any message at all if God hadn't meant for us to see for ourselves. So we decided to obey the instructions to go seek out the Messiah Partly from excitement and partly from a sense of urgency for getting back to our sheep, we ran into town and searched until we found the baby lying in the feeding box, just like the angel told us. And though we were just children and didn't appear out of thin air and didn't shine, far from it, our arrival still surprised the young mother and her betrothed. We stood at the edge of the stable area trying to catch our breath. Is this the Messiah? We asked. What's his name? The couple looked at each other, seemingly puzzled by our questions. They finally asked us, what brings you here tonight? Though we didn't expect them to believe us, we told them what had happened in the field in the angel's message. When we mentioned the angel's visitation, the couple looked at each other again and their expressions seemed to show that they knew what we were talking about. When we finished our story, they invited us to come closer. His mother said, this is Yeshua. Yeshua, God is my salvation. That matched the angel's words, a savior has been born. As we rested in the presence of this tiny baby, time seemed to almost stand still. Though we wanted to touch and hold him, we knew we weren't clean enough to be holding a baby, and I don't think any of us had the nerve to touch the Messiah even if we had been clean. We would have liked to have stayed, but it was obvious that the mother was still tired from her labor, and she seemed to be thinking hard about what we had told her like she was trying to figure out a puzzle. And besides that, we had sheep that needed tending. Quietly, solemnly, we rose and bid the new family farewell. We walked silently for a few blocks, still awed by what we had seen, and awed that we had been allowed to see it. Us, mere children. Us, mere shepherds. And though we may be lowly shepherds and second thoughts as children, God sent his angels to us. God welcomed us. So much to think about. So much to wonder about. In that moment in the stable, I felt closer to God than I had ever felt before, as if that baby were indeed God. A flash of thought entered my mind along with a memory of something I had wondered before. I can't become a sheep, but did God just become a baby? Before I could start pondering that spark of an idea, someone started whispering a prayer of thanks to God for allowing us to be a part of this, and the rest of us joined in. Our excitement renewed. We began shouting as we ran back to our sheep, our best imitation of the angel's shout of praise, the highest honor and glory be to God in heaven. And let his peace rest upon those on earth who please him. May that be our goal in this new year, to please him. Thank you.
In 1818, in a church in Austria, the organ broke before the Christmas Eve service. Young priest Joseph Moore was trying to figure out how to salvage the service that was upcoming. So he wrote a song for that occasion that he could play on a guitar. And it's a beloved Christmas song that we know as Silent Night. stand. May God bless you this Merry Christmas in, in 2023. Get back in the 1900s. 2023. Can you imagine that? Being in the 21st century. Amazing. God bless you, keep you, and strengthen you through this time of season and also in the next year to come. May you be blessed as you go through. Father, thank you so much for this night. Thank you that we're here to celebrate the birth of our Savior, the coming into this world. But we know also that we are here because he paid the full price for our redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. And we look to you with great joy in our heart, for we have, we are, the redeemed of the Lord. May this be a reminder to our souls and that we may keep our faith in you throughout the turmoil that is going to be coming in 2024. And may our hearts always be joyfully ringing with the thanksgiving for what you have done for us. Bless your people, strengthen us, and encourage us. In Jesus' name, I pray.